Delanda. I have first encountered Delanda's work during grad school when I was uh, getting into this complex text of French philosopher Deleuze, which undoubtedly I could not have gone through it without reading Delanda. I think uh, he has the amazing gift of taking complex ideas and explaining it in such a simple way that anyone could possibly understand this very rich uh, philosophy of De uh, Deleuze. I think it's probably accurate to say that anyone who's reading Deleuze now has Deleuze in one hand and Delanda in the other. Anyway, having tasted Deleuze's seductive words in the 70s, in 1975, Delanda had moved from Mexico City to New York uh, to begin his work as an independent filmmaker and engaged in computer arts. In the 80s, he turned his attention to the computer, where he bought his first computer for about $10,000, which he soon realized that he has this big chunk of box, expensive box, but no software to run what he needed to run. So he immediately engaged in um, Pro, uh, computer programming, learning uh, Pascal language, and stemming from being a pioneer programmer, he soon then became the leading theorist of electronic arts. With his integration of Deleuze's thought to the act of creation, he focuses his teachings on the sciences of complexity, explicating thoughts on dynamic systems in areas of self-organization, nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory, material complexity, artificial intelligence, and so forth, through discursive fields from language to matter philosophy to economics to ecologies of cities. He is a, he is a cultural archaeologist, technologist, philosopher, historicist, and a science writer almost the Diderot of 21st century. Of the many ways that, dis <laughs> that we can describe Delanda, the overarching term that comes to my mind is relevance. He is by far one of the most relevant thinkers of today that cohere complex ideas with the deep scholarly interrogation that have for years helped shape thoughts to those embodying the principles of dynamism in their practice. Based in New York, he is currently teaching at UPenn and Pratt and have lectured worldwide. We are very fortunate to have him with us this semester. He's teaching a seminar course entitled Theories of Self-Organizations and Dynamics of Cities, uh, which all the students agree is incredibly enriching, provocative, and highly informative. Delanda is also the author of several influential books, amongst them War in the Age of Intelligent Machines, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy, A New Philosophy of Society, and his latest Philosophy and Simulation. Not to mention many other books he had written for um, articles for, for which is the first time that I met him when, when um, I was producing the monograph of Knox with Lars Bybrick in Rotterdam in 2003. And, um, and just as a side story, in Rotterdam, I had the chance to, to meet Brad Pitt to explain to him the works that we were doing. And long story short, I dissed Brad Pitt because he was two hours late. But later on, when I heard that Delanda was coming to our office, everything stopped, including my nerves, because I was so nervous that I was going to finally meet this great thinker whom I respected and known only through his books. So the point of the story is between Brad Pitt and Delanda, there's no comparison. <laughs> so please help me welcome this awesome rock and roll philosopher, Manuel de Landa. Wow. Wow, what an introduction. It's going to be hard to live up to that introduction. Yeah, I taught Brad Pitt how to fight. I invented Fight Club, as a matter of fact. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, guys, I'm going to have to to introduce this lecture by telling you I changed the subject matter. It was announced in the poster and, and, and it's been announced for a while that it was going to be how to use computers to model urban dynamics. That's an interesting subject. But because I'm teaching my students a, a two-week lecture series on urban dynamics, covering everything from the biology of cities, the economics of cities, linguistics aspects of cities, military aspects, transportation aspects, and so on, I didn't want my students to have to sit through yet another lecture on cities and urban stuff, so I changed gears midway and I'm announcing this for the first time. We're not going to be talking about cities, we're going to be talking about simulations of Darwinian evolution in the computer and how they can be used by designers, such as architects. That's not as catchy a title as the other one. 
but nevertheless, it is a very interesting subject. Also, this particular version of the talk is the 2.0 version, so to speak. The original lecture is called Deleuze and the Use of Genetic Algorithms in Architecture. That's, that's been available in YouTube and even iTunes for a long time, so I did not want to bore you with something that's, that you can watch on your iPhone. So I decided to do the 2.0 version of that lecture, getting much more in-depth into the, the specifics of genetic algorithms, genetic programming, and how to, how to use evolutionary processes, simulated evolutionary processes, to, as an aid in the design process. Now let me emphasize this at the very beginning. I do not believe that genetic algorithms or genetic programming are going to replace the artist, are going to replace the designer. Genetic algorithms and genetic programming will be added to your toolbox of design elements. It, 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 the genetic algorithm is, as a matter of fact, old enough. It was invented in the 60s. He was only given a name in the 70s, but nevertheless, that's already 40 years ago. Uh, it's so old, so relatively old and well tried industrially, that soon is going to appear as a menu entry in your Maya a CAD system or in your Autodesk and so on. It, it's, it's, it's a kind of software that has matured enough that can now be included as a menu item. The problem with having something as a menu item, of course, is that if you don't have the philosophical background or the philosophy of science background to, to place this new tool in context, a new entry in the menu will just simply be a new entry in the menu, something you click in to try it out and so on, but without really understanding, you know, how this is supposed to be useful to you as artists. So this will never replace the artist, it will be one more tool in the artist toolbox. It will be a visualization tool, similar to what CAD is. And uh, the main, uh, just the main thought before I start getting into the actual details of how you do these things. The main thought behind this is this. The genetic algorithm is classified in computer science as a search algorithm. Search algorithms are very important in computer science because just about anything that you do in your computer, saving a file, looking, you know, saving a file, the computer has to search your hard disk for space for the file. There's always, there's, there's not always enough space for the whole file to be fit in one place, so it has to find several places where to fit your file. Of course, you need to then find that file, so that's another search operation. And there is, of course, the fact that you can become a Googleionaire if you devise the right way of searching the internet. So there's always the money uh, motive there. Nevertheless, search algorithms are extremely important in, in computer science. And uh, whenever a new way of searching a space of possibilities or a space of alternatives is found, it gets a, a, a whole, it gets the entire a, a computer science community excited. No one knew, as a matter of fact, that evolution, Darwinian evolution, was in fact or could be considered, could be conceptualized as a search in a space of possible designs. The evolution of vertebrates is a space in the, in the, in the, in the space of possible vertebrate designs. Now we can think of it right now just strictly in terms of architecture, architecture slash structural engineering, and think of vertebrates as designs in which the bones carry loads in compression Muscles carry loads in tension, and from the interaction between those two elements, interface via cartilage and tendon, you get a very versatile form of architecture. But in addition to the architecture of a single uh, vertebrate species, there is the space of all possible vertebrate species, with some areas consisting of fish species, other areas consisting of reptile species, other areas consisting of mammalian species, bird species, and so on. And evolution can be seen as a search in this space. Of course, the search is a blind search, or if you want to put it more accurately, a nearsighted search, because evolution doesn't have foresight. Evolution cannot say, I'm going to benefit this proto-wing, this little bit of a limb that will eventually become a wing, because 200 years, 300 years later, it will become good to fly. Evolution is opportunistic, it can only use what is at hand. So, but nevertheless, when an entire population, an entire reproductive community, 
performs this search in parallel, it can be a very uh, efficient way of searching a space of possibilities. And computer scientists have realized that. So the genetic algorithm and genetic programming, even though they have obvious bio biological roots and they are trying to mimic Darwinian evolution, are not necessarily used, or at least not, is not their, their most important use is not to create models for biologists, for evolutionary biologists. It's not really an evolutionary biologist tool, although it can obviously, I'm starting to hear music in my head. <laughs> you know, am I going crazy? No, it won't go away. Okay, now it's probably my iPhone. Everybody's going for their phones, you know. So, <laughs> So the, 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 the genetic algorithm as a search algorithm, highly efficient because it searches in parallel. It's an entire population of replicating chromosomes that performs the search. And so what has become now interesting is, of course, how we design the spaces themselves. Despite the fact that the genetic algorithm tends to replace the designer with, or tends to at least change the role of the designer to that of a dog breeder or a horse breeder, since you are basically selecting, acting as a selection pressure on an evolutionary process that you don't quite control in detail, there are many points of entry at which your, your judgment, your taste, uh, your intuition as a designer can come in. There are many points of creativity. And um, perhaps the most important one is in the design of the space of possibilities itself. When you look at the work of people like William Latham, William Latham, L-A-T-H-A-M, was one of the first sculptors to use genetic algorithms back in the late 80s, early 90s. At first, it is particularly true if you do 3D modeling by hand, you know, extruding and surface of revolution and then twisting and so on, and you know how hard it is to create 3D models that look good, when you look at his uh, bread sculptures, you go, oh my god, I can't believe that this was not actually touched by a human hand, that these that this forms were actually evolved within the computer all by themselves. But then, as you begin uh, flipping through the pages of his book, you begin to feel that he's running out of forms, that, that, the, that the, the genetic algorithm is finding the same form over and over and over again, or similar forms. Whereas, of course, the space of possible vertebrates is an infinite space that continues to amaze us every time that we think about it. For instance, just think of before, again, this is a part of the introduction before going into the technical details. Think of the space of vertebrates before mammals came on, on Earth. Or when mammals were just these rat-like creatures, ugly, nocturnal, hairy, furry, cross-eyed creatures that, that, that look very disgusting. And, and the rest of the world was dominated by reptile species of all different kinds and designs. Flying reptiles, crawling reptiles, snakes of different types. If a Martian zoologist would have come to Earth and looked at those rat-like creatures that are our ancestors, he would have gone, oh my god, please don't show me that. Show me the reptiles. Those are the real masters of, of this space. Who would have thought that inside the chromosome of those rat-like creatures there were giraffes, rhinoceros, elephants, dolphins, whales, monkeys of different types, primates of different types, including us humans. No one could have possibly predicted that. And yet that chromosome was rich enough that given, it, given a chance, given something that opened up ecological niches for all those different species to go and occupy them and develop specializations to occupy those niches and do that ecological, and perform their ecological job, who would have thought that that existed within that chromosome? The reptiles, of course, at the time were occupying all the niches, were keeping the mammals from evolving and differentiating. And of course, thanks to that a meteorite that is hypothesized hit Earth and uh, created a, a, a kind of a nuclear winter that killed most larger reptiles, a lot of niches opened up, and all of a sudden that chromosome was able to differentiate. The important point here is this. From a theoretical, philosophical point of view, the space of possible mammals 
even though it was not given already in that chromosome, was already prefigured in that chromosome. And it was a very rich space. And moreover, a space that could complexify and increase impossibilities as evolution continued its march, containing all the different mammalian designs, the, the amazing variety of mammalian designs that we are familiar with. Well, the quest, the main, or one of the most important points about using Darwinian evolution in the computer as a design tool, as an aid, is precisely to, uh, uh, to have a tool that allows you to explore possibility spaces. But if the possibility spaces are not well designed, that is, if there is not creativity in the design of the possibility spaces, the possibility spaces are too poor like the ones that William Latham explored back in the early 90s. So there's the very first and perhaps most important point of entry for creativity. And, and this is going to become more of an issue the, the more we go into the 21st century. How to design possibility spaces that are rich enough that you can leave a genetic algorithm overnight doing its evolutionary thing. You can wake up the following morning, look at the screen and go, oh my god. Did I design that? I'm a genius. In other words, what you, what you really want a genetic algorithm to do is to surprise you. If it doesn't surprise you, you might as well do it by hand. Because many of the things that you do with genetic algorithms, you already do by hand. When you say, are asked to design a new facade for a building, well, you put four, five, six different variations of a, of a different facade. You, pull back, you step back, you look at them, you go, the first three are not going to fly. So let me take this two and I'm going to create variations on those two, say five variations each. Now you put ten drawings in front of you and you examine them and you go, hmm, the first five are just not going to fly. So I'm going to take them out, so I, there's five left, I'm going to now do variations on those five. And you continue the process until you zero in something that you like. Well, what you just did was basically what evolution does is you create variations and then perform on every generation of variations a test, a selection test. These guys go and get to reproduce into the next generation. These guys don't get to reproduce in the next generation. So variation followed by selection. That is the key to evolution. No variation, no heterogeneity in a gene pool, no evolution. But again, no filter, nothing that selects one variable replicator over another, no evolution either. So we need both. And we're going to be talking about both. In fact, each side of the board concentrates on the replicators itself with their source of variation, and then the fitness function that is the one that actually selects which replicators get to produce virtual offspring in the next, into the next generation, or how many offspring they have into the next generation. So you guys already do this. You already engage in variation and selection, at least as one of many strategies of design. So if you can do it by hand, why do it by computer? Well, there's absolutely no reason, unless, of course, the space of possibilities that you're searching is enormous because you have put a lot of thought into it and therefore exploring it by hand or by foot if you want to is prohibitive. So you use the genetic algorithm simply as an aid, as an aid in exploring that space of possibilities. Okay, now let me then start going into the more technical stuff. I'm going to contrast two approaches to simulated Darwinian evolution. One older and better, better known, the other one newer but much more powerful. In the end, I'm going to end up saying, as architects slash structural engineers, you are, you are much better off using genetic programming, although it is harder to master. But nevertheless, we need to start historically with the, with the genetic algorithm because it's older and it's, it's the, it's the program that put this approach on the map. The genetic algorithm was created by a computer scientist. His name is John Holland, very famous. He has gone on to design a variety of other type of other softwares that are all of them leading edge. And he's always been at the cutting edge of whatever it is that uh, computer scientists are doing at the time. The main difference between the two approaches is 
how you specify the chromosome, how you specify the genes, the genetic materials of the creatures that you're breeding in the computer. In this case, the creatures are, of course, buildings or some other architectonic engineering structure like bridges, skyscrapers, uh, uh, residential buildings of different types, and so on. So we're talking about load-bearing structures. It's important to consider, I'm always addressing you guys, as well as my students, as architects slash structural engineers. Because your, your structures need to bear loads. Your structures need to fight gravity successfully. Therefore, you are not sculptors. Sculptors can use a genetic algorithm in a much easier way, because they will, able, they will need to generate only something that will hold itself up in a museum or in some kind of exhibit. But you guys need to actually create something that is between art and science, something that is a combination of arts and science. Now I know that uh, there's a division of labor in our society such that you guys do the design and then you hire a structural engineer to do all the scientific part of the thing. And of course if the building falls down, you know, the engineer gets sued, not you. So I guess that's a good deal. But remember that unlike the structural engineers of the past, who were very routine, very repetitive, very boring, who perhaps did not like that much creativity, and I'm overgeneralizing this, and if I'm insulting somebody in the audience, I apologize. There's today a new generation, Cecil Ballmond is perhaps the, 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 the better known example, who are engineer artists. They solve load-bearing pro problems, but in unique ways. So when you go to Cecil Ballman and say, hey, Cecil, like say Rem Koolhaas has done on a couple of occasions, solve me this load-bearing problem without beams, without columns, and even without a frame with rigid joints. And Cecil Ballman comes up with a fantastic new design. Well, at that point, Cecil Ballman is already eating half of your lunch. Yes, you will be able to add a few touches here and there, but if the solution is so unique, then the building is at least half, if not a little more, his design. And the idea here is that you cannot let engineers eat your lunch. You need to at least become half engineers. You will never be able to replace them. You need that division of labor. There's no time to do everything yourself. But nevertheless, you need to be able to talk to them one-to-one, -one. be able to use scientific terms just the way they use them, and being able to use creative terms in the engineering field just the way they do. So it, so, and that translates directly into the genetic algorithm. In order to run the genetic algorithm successfully, to do architecture as opposed to sculpture, you need to consider the, gene the, the structural engineering aspects of it. Let's move on. The most important difference between the two is the type of virtual chromosome they use. The genetic algorithm uses the simplest possible chromosome. So it's a bit string. It's a string of ones and zeros. Everybody knows bit stands for binary digit, that is a one or a zero, so a bit string is the word for a chain of ones and zeros. Now, many things in a computer are chains of ones and zeros. Nevertheless, it is very limiting because the most important thing, the most important problem that you have to solve before you begin using evolution in the computer is how you're going to map genotype into phenotype. Without big words, how are you going to map genes to the bodily traits that they code for? In your case, the architectural traits and the structural engineering traits of the final design. How are you going to unfold the genetic information into something that is a functional building? When you have a chromosome that is just a bit string, you have to come up with very elaborate coding instructions. It can be done. You can come up with some arbitrary code that, that assigns to a bunch of uh, uh, ones and zeros, say, 100 zero zero becomes extrusion, 111 one one becomes surface of revolution, 101 one becomes twist, 110 one becomes stretch, and all, all the different operations that you can use in your CAD system, you give them a code, and that then becomes the code. But it is very hard to then specify a sequence of instructions that actually produces something interesting. It will be one extrusion that then by mutation becomes a surface of revolution, that then by, by mutation becomes another extrusion, and all those things perform randomly, 
don't tend to gen generate good sculptures, let alone good load-bearing structures. Nevertheless, there is a very good use for genetic algorithms. It's good for parametric design. Let me explain. One of the early triumphs of the genetic algorithm was to, remember that it's a search algorithm, was to find, it was, it, was, it was at first used in optimization problems, when you need to, which are of course the simplest type of problems. The type of problems that many engineers love, because once you found the optimal solution, well then no one can argue with, with you. This is the optimal solution. Nevertheless, Though the spaces explored can have many optima, many local optima, and you, at, at that point you might need to justify a little bit more than just saying, well, you know, this is an optimum design. Well, yeah, but there were several optima. So, in engineering applications, optimization problems can be performed in a parametric way. Let me just give you an example from real life. This is something that the genetic algorithm actually solved early on in its career. It was a pipeline, an oil pipeline problem, and the, the basic problem was how to optimize the pumps at each one of the stations along, all along the pipeline, I believe there were 10 pumps, in which certain uh, parameters pressure, the pressure of the pump, the amount of oil flowing, and certain constraints as to maximum, minimum pressure, and so on, had to be all satisfied at once. And the question is, how can we find the combination of pressures in those 10 pumps so that to us to optimize the, the flow of oil through the pipeline. Well, let's assume that the maximum pressure in your, in your pump was 15, any number would do, because 1, 1, 1, 1, that is 4 ones, happens to be the number 15 in binary. So let's assume that that was the maximum pressure. That means that every four digits in your bit string can represent a single parameter. A 0, 0, 0, 0 would represent a zero value for that parameter. 0, 0, 0, 1 would be number 1, and so on, on to 1, 1, 1, 1, which is the number 15, maximum pressure. In, in, in reality, I'm, I, don't, I can't remember right now how many bits there were for this particular example. It doesn't really matter. So you separate out your chromosome into genes, each four digits representing one particular pump. And then you unleashed, just like John Holland did, a population of these chromosomes in the computer, and using a fitness function as a filter, as a selection pressure, you begin to approach the optimal level of parameters little by little, and in a day or two, the genetic algorithm found the optimal combination of pressures for that pipeline. So simple optimization problems are very easy to code into the genetic algorithm. Of course, you guys are not in the business of designing pipelines or even of determining pressures for anything. You want to design something that is visually interesting and that makes a difference, that is significant in, 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 the, in, in the history of design, that makes a difference, that separates itself from other designs. However, you can still do it parametrically. The very first creative act here, though, unlike the pipeline example, is to create the space itself, that is to, to find the parameters. In the case of the pipeline example, the parameters were already given. What's the pressure for each one of the pumps? In your case, you need to find parameters that, are, that make a difference. Typically, those parameters are not going to be a single variable, like height or width or anything like that. They, were, they, were, they have to be creatively constructed. In particular, for, at, at the, at the, they have to be relations between variables. And those relationships are not given. Those relationships are found, and you need a designer to find them, because it's only the designer that can see if the visual output by turning this parameter changes in a significant way. So at the very least, you, can, you need to use the simplest of mathematical relationships, a ratio. The ratio of, say, height to width. So that when you change that parameter, not just the height of the building changes, and we're talking about, of course, a CAD representation of a building, a 3D model of a building, but something more interesting changes, the relations between several properties of your building. So finding the parameters is not trivial. Finding the parameters is, in fact, a creative task. 
Now, assuming that you have dedicated some time to finding interesting parameters, now you may end up with, say, five, six, ten parameters, all of which, by turning the knob, change this, the, the design in interesting ways, in significant ways, in non-trivial ways. Well, okay, so now you have ten parameters, and now you have to start exploring all the different combinations of the parameters. A ten-parameter a problem is equivalent to a space of possible designs with ten dimensions. One dimension per parameter. Now a ten-dimensional space contains a very large number of designs and it can take you forever to explore it completely by hand. Nevertheless, you can just unleash a population of virtual chromosomes, a population of bit strings, each one of which has been adapted to, to, so that one, 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 whatever the, the length of the, of the gene is, represents the maximum value of the parameter. You can change the, the length of genes to adapt it to different types of parameters, but you need to end up with 10 genes strung together into a bit string in such a way that it is very clear what parameter corresponds to what gene. And then you simply unleash the genetic algorithm. You unleash a population of these parameters. As I said at the beginning of the talk, the key here is not just that this bit string can replicate, but that it can replicate with variation. And at that point, another creative decision comes in. How do you produce the variation? In nature, asexual organisms use only one mode of generating variation, mutation accidental flippings of one gene into another gene or of a couple of genes into other couple of genes. Mutation can lead you, can bring you a long way. In fact, the bacteria that discovered most of the metabolic strategies that we still use today, fermentation, photosynthesis and respiration, it took, it took them two billion years, which is a long time, but they discovered all those three ways of tapping into energy all by themselves using only mutation to generate variation. But even mutation, which in this case would be to flip a one into a zero or a zero into a one by chance at random, needs to be applied carefully. Let me give you an example. In one use of the genetic algorithm used for, uh, used for music to generate uh, jazz, as it, as it happens, uh, the, the program is called Gen Jam. I have heard the music that it produces. I'm not a big jazz fan, so I cannot really appreciate it, but I know that the guy travels around in jazz clubs using the computer as a, as a companion. And remember how a jazz jam uh, works. You are the piano guy, so you are playing the piano and you are now you know, creating melodies and, and variations on your melodies in such a way as to impress the clarinet guy. When the clarinet guy is, is when it's his turn, when you go take it away clarinet, the guy cannot just go off into some, you know, his own trip. He has to mine what you just did for melodic ideas and begin variations on what you just did so as to be able to impress you. So you go, oh my God, you know, and I, I didn't hit on that particular variation. That's very interesting, clarinet. And the same thing when he goes, take it away, piano. You now have to be responding to the clarinet. You cannot just go off on your own. So when this guy decided to use a computer as his uh, assistant or as his, as his uh, jam player, he couldn't just put a bunch of pre-recorded melodies and pretend that he was responding to it. Instead, what he did was give it a genetic algorithm have the computer listen to him all the time as he's playing through a microphone, then changing those melodies into ones and zeros. As it happens in the case of music, that's very easy to do because manufacturers of synthesizers in the 80s created a code, a binary code, for that basically code. It's called a MIDI code that codes for every aspect of a musical event. It's pitch, it's timbre, it's, uh, uh, it's frequency, it's how high the frequency is, how low the frequency is, it's volume, whether it's a silence or whether it's a, it's a musical event. All of it is coded in MIDI. And so therefore, it's very relatively easy to hear music through a microphone and transform it into bit strings. And then the computer algorithm would explore the space of possible melodies. So when the guy went, finished with the piano, I guess the, the guy was playing the clarinet, it's like, well, take it away, computer. The computer was actually mining his partners or its partners' I melodic ideas and uh, 
you know, trying to surprise him with new, with new things. And it actually worked. But when the guy began to apply the mutation operator, he realized he could not apply it directly to the bit string because it would generate sounds that, were not, that did not belong to the sound space of jazz, that did not belong to the sound space of Western music to begin with. So he had to, just to make a creative decision as to when and how to apply the mutation operator. I'm not going to go into, into the details here. The point being, though, that you needed a musician to find that point. An engineer that doesn't know about music would, wouldn't have had that idea. It, you needed a musician to recognize that the mutation operator needed to be applied in just the right way, at just the right level of abstraction, not at the very bottom of the chromosome. So the same thing with architecture, the same thing with uh, engineering. You need an artist to be able to make certain decisions as to how the genetic algorithm is used. The second mode of generating variation is called sexual recombination, which is paradoxical from an evolutionary point of view in the sense that if you clone yourself, remember that in evolution all that matters is who passes the most genes to the next generation. That's basically all that matters. But if you clone yourself, you pass your whole gene, your entire chromosome, whereas if you have sex with another bacterian, hopefully you're not going to have sex with another bacterian, <laughs> You only pass half your genes, which means that evolutionarily it doesn't make sense because you are basically cheated of half your genes. Only half your chromosome makes it into the next generation. So sex is a mystery unless you consider that sexual recombination by putting together half a chromosome from a father and half a chromosome from a mother that may be from a distant part in the reproductive community brings together different traits and elements that have perhaps evolved a slightly different and recombines him in a productive way. That theory of sex, that is the explanation of sex in terms of a generator of variation, is still debatable. It has not reached consensus in the evolutionary biologist community, but the genetic algorithm has proved that sex rules. You run the genetic algorithm with a mutation operator on only, and it won't find even the solution to the pipe, to the oil pipeline optimization problem. You add sex, and as with everything in life, the lights go up and, you know, fun starts. So the crossover operator, as it is called technically, because it, it takes half of the, uh, parent, uh, the father's chromosome, crosses it over to the mother's chromosome and glues it at a random point, the crossover operator now has proved to be the key to the effectiveness of the genetic algorithm, although John Holland and others are still debating, and it's still a matter of debate, why exactly sex works. Nobody knows. Sex is a mystery. And I thought I was the only one who didn't know what it was doing. <laughs> genetic programming. Genetic programming is what I would recommend you guys to use. I mean, as I just said, if you're a good design of parametric spaces, then all you need is a genetic algorithm. But that's a big if, because designing, designing the spaces themselves is a creative act. You cannot just pick any bunch of parameters, any bunch of variables, height, you know, width, and so on. You need to find relevant relations. And that is a creative act. Now, if you get to do that, then all you need is a genetic algorithm. But if you want to go beyond that, if you want to go beyond parametric design into procedural design or algorithmic design, that is, designs that are produced by a process, a process is specified step by step in the form of a script or in the form of a small little program, then the genetic algorithm becomes almost useless. As I said, you can come up with convoluted ways of coding operations into the ones and zeros of the bit string, but you cannot control the sequencing of those operations. You cannot control, a, 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 you know, you cannot add, say, things like, if you finish doing this particular part of the body, then stop and then start this other part of the body. You cannot put if-then conditions. So the best way of doing a design that is produced by a process is to switch to John Cosa's genetic programming. John Cosa's approach is new, er, but it has already proved, in its, in its, you know, it's, it's, it's only 20 years old or so, but it has already proved in the two decades of its existence that it has much more, that is a much more powerful approach to generating form 
than John, than, 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 than John Holland's approach. The, the, uh, of course, the, genetic, the virtual chromosome is a computer software program. In, this, in the case of genetic programming, it's, ri it's written in a program, la programming language called Lisp. That shouldn't concern us uh, right now. And Lisp is valuable because it, it, can on, it cannot not only be represented as a sequence of instructions, as most computer programs can, but also, in addition, can be given a tree-like form in which at each one of the nodes there is an if-then conditional, so that, you know, move to that node. If the roof has already been completed, then move on to construct the side of the house. Or you know, the if-then instructions can be given as semantics that actually fit your particular concerns. And or those nodes can be direct operations. Rather, the end leaves of the tree, the, what is called the terminals, are now directly executable operations. What operations you use depending on what design you want to end up with. In architecture, there would be operations as in a CAD system, extrusion, a surface of revolution, stretching, bending, and so on. John Cosa tested his ideas with some very tough problems. In particular, he wanted a problem that was so tough that people would be convinced that he was actually on the right track. So he decided to pick, he decided to, to, to approach the problem of how to generate automatically, how to breed analog electrical circuits. Now, unlike digital circuits, which are relatively easy the design of which is relatively easy to automate because digital circuits ultimately at the bottom are all made out of AND operators, OR operators, IF THEN operators, NOT operators. That is a Boolean operations that were originally part of binary calculus. Uh, electrical, analog electrical circuit designs are a hand job. You need to actually assign them by hand and you need an artist, an engineering artist, to design him. So he decided, to, obviously, to go with that because it was more challenging. But moreover, he picked as his targets for this evolutionary process three designs that had been previously patented by humans. The reason was very simple. The patent office had already acted as a selection pressure. The patent office is charged with a task of telling when a design is sufficiently original relative to previous designs. If your design is a mere improvement over a previous design, they probably won't give you a patent. Your, your design needs to have contributed with something that it was hard to come up with, with something that it is original. I mean, I realize that the definition of originality is, is extremely vague, and that is why the job of being a patent uh, clerk or a patent officer is a tough job. You need to know the history of that particular design area that you are accepting or rejecting applications for, and then to have a, an eye for originality, an eye for saying, wow, this way of creating a filter, this way of creating an amplifier, this way of creating a sensor or any other analog electrical circuit is a unique solution to the problem of amplifying, filtering, sensing. So he picked three designs that had already been patented. With that, he made sure that if his genetic programming worked, it would match, at least to a certain extent, human creativity. In other words, it would match three previously patented designs that had, that had necessitated human creative input in order for them to come into existence and be, improved, and be approved by the patent office. He managed to match all three designs after a, hundred, a few hundred generations. He, in other words, he managed to, found those, to find those designs in the space of all possible electrical circuit designs. Or if you, if you want to, because his designs were more specialized in the space of all possible amplifiers, the space of all possible filters, the space of all possible sensors, and so on for each one of the designs. And that was very impressive. Therefore, what he needs to breed, what, or rather what the population is, the population of replicators is, are computer programs that specify how to construct something, how to build something. So, so the instructions that are at the end of each one of those three uh, branches are 
construction instructions. And at the, at the, at the other nodes are if then, or other ways of redirecting the procedure, that says if such and such task has already finished, then do this other task. Which gives you a much more flexible way of specifying the form that you want to eventually arrive at. Now, another thing that's good from uh, John Cosa, and, and therefore, if you are going to use this, if you're going to hacker your way into, into using genetic programming for your architectural problems, I suggest that you read the, at least the volume. He has four volumes called Genetic Programming, the one that, that describes in detail the, the example that I just gave you, because in addition to matching human creativity and all his original goals, he did something that was very clever. Every generation, the population of chromosomes that has been generated needs to be passed through some kind of selection pressure, as I said. Variation plus selection that generates the evolution. And that selective function, or that selective activity, that selective uh, uh, role, is played by something called the fitness function. The name doesn't really matter. It certainly is not a mathematical function, a simple way of doing it. The fitness function can be a gigantic program, it doesn't matter what, as long as it checks chromosome by chromosome and assigns fitness values to them. These guys are better, given the goals of the design, these guys are worse, and then calls another function called the selection function, which then goes and, and, and picks mothers and fathers from the, high, the more highly valued fitness function, or the fitness values, and allows them to mate to create the next generation. The fitness function acts as a filter, as a, as a sorting device. It allows some replicators to make more, more copies of themselves. It allows others not to make as many copies. It eliminates others altogether, the ones that get very low fitness values from the population. But it has to be applied every single time. Now, of course, you could use yourself as a fitness function. You simply run the genetic algorithm, and every time you, know, you have a genetic programming that constructs shapes in a CAD system, and it shows you the shapes. And then you would, just like you rate songs in iTunes, or rate you know, things in, in, in different programs, you would rate the form. That's good, that's not so good, that's really bad, that's not so good. But if you have to stand there, or sit there, and assign fitness functions by hand to every single generation, well, you're not going to be able to run more than 10, 20 generations a day. And the whole point is to be able to leave the computer alone to generate 1,000, 10,000 generations so that it can really explore that space. So the idea, that, a very good idea that Cosa had is instead of, for, for his uh, analog electrical circuits, instead of trying to design a complex way of evaluating electrical circuitry that a subject that I don't know anything about, let's grab existing software that can already do that, existing software used by electrical analog circuit designers that can take a circuit specified in a certain way, in a standard way, and tell this is working as a filter, this is working as an amplifier, this is working as a sensor, and it is working this well. That way, every generation, all that Cosa had to do was to run his little programs to build those electrical circuits and then send each electrical circuit one at a time to the already existing software package. Of course, it had to be done in the format that the software package accepts, but nevertheless, he didn't design that software package, and then get some number from the software package. You know, it's rated as 0.7 in the filter scale, or it's rated as 0.6 in the amplifier scale, and then he would use that number as the fitness value. That was a brilliant idea. Because otherwise, everybody trying to adapt genetic algorithms for different things, for painting, for music, for choreography, for architecture, for sculpture, and so on, would have to write their own fitness functions in very complicated ways instead of just choosing exist existing software that could do that for you. So, as the first thing that you need to check when you are doing, when you are an architect slash structural engineer, is of course to check for the structural engineering integrity of your structure. If you began with a building that was bearing loads using beams and columns, 
Well, if a column by a, some crazy mutation moved to the middle of the beam and now is not playing its role, it should be eliminated immediately because now the building is not going to be able to sustain itself. But you don't want to have to write the software that checks for that. So why not just use an existing package for structural engineering, such as finite element analysis or many other packages that exist. All you would have to master is the standard way in which you have to describe the different structural elements to that program in order for that program to check for the structural, the structural integrity. And therefore, every generation, all you do is run the little program build the actual CAD design that that program represents, send it to the structural engineering program, and get a score back for that, uh, for that uh, uh, design. And that is going to become part of the fitness value of that particular building. It's, it's, it's a beautiful solution, precisely because it avoids having to do anything that it would be too hard or you would have to hire a mathematician to do. If already there is existing software, use that existing software. So let's assume that we already have a way of checking for structural integrity and that gives us a value that, will be, that would enter into the final fitness value. The second one, checking for aesthetics, is tougher because aesthetics, as far as I can tell, has not been formalized. And if something has not been formalized, it cannot be understood by a computer. Computers are stupid. Unless they are running some clever artificial intelligence program, they really don't know how to think about anything. They know how to follow blind, uh, uh, infallible mechanical recipes. That's the definition of an algorithm, an infallible mechanical recipe. As long as it's mechanical, specify step by step, and as long as it always gives the right results, the computer will be happy. So we don't have that for aesthetics. So there are several possibilities here. One would be to say, well, to decide on what style or what famous architect you want to roughly be in, and what space of designs as defined, what, what stylistic spaces you want to design in, and then try to define a grammar for that particular famous architect. Now, this, the specification of formal grammars for paintings, for music, and so on, has its, it's in its infancy, and I personally do not believe that anyone has actually succeeded in creating in creating a, a computer program that can actually make aesthetic evaluations in, some, in, in a way that it is reliable. So if we don't have a way of evaluating the aesthetics, then what can we do? Well, we can cheat, which is okay, because we, again, we are being hackers here. We're not being computer scientists. We're trying to get something to work. And the way to cheat would be to use another computer program that is capable of learning about your taste so that it can check whether the designs that are being generated in the computer fit what you already believe is good design as opposed to what you believe is really bad design. In other words, you're using your own taste as a filter. The computer software that we need here is called neural nets or neural networks. Neural nets are a form of artificial intelligence that is not symbolic. A neural net, you don't program a neural net. You train a neural net in the way in which you would train a dog to catch a frisbee. You don't tell anything to your dog, you don't talk to your dog, you practice with your dog until it learns to catch the frisbee. You train it. Neural nets are also trained. They don't have a single line of code. But they, and yet, they perform flawlessly when it comes to pattern recognition. If you take a neural net and train it with faces, say, it will soon say the training mechanism is similar to that that you would use with a dog. That is, show them a particular example and then let, it, let the neural net know that you are gratifying it, that you're rewarding it because it did the, the right job, and then show it something that is completely different, say, in the case of faces, a car or a tree, and if the neural net recognizes it, then let the neural net know that that's a bad recognition step, or if it says, no, that's not a face, then reward it, just like you would do with your dog and the frisbee. It's a, it's a training process using behaviorism. Reward and punishment as a means of letting the, 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 the dog know, yes, that's the way you catch a frisbee, no, you bit the, the mailman instead. 
In the case of neural nets, they have already proved themselves. You train them, you put in the, you put, you train them with a, you know, you connect a video camera to the neural net and show them photographs of faces, and then you show them many other pictures of non-faces, tree scars and so on. And after the training is over, you show them a face and they, and they will light up. If you show them a non-face and it won't light up. If you continue the training, they can actually learn how to tell male from female faces. And if you continue the training, and now we're talking about a thousand sessions of training, they can actually learn how to tell individual human faces from different angles and say, yes, that is the same individual from different angles. No, that is not the same individual as before. They perform fantastically as pattern recognition devices. They are entirely dumb. They don't know they have recognized anything. All they know is how to match a pattern that was in the training, in the training set to an, uh, a, a response. Yes, that's a face. No, that's not a face. So the idea here would be to collect a variety of designs, of architectural designs that you already like or within the, the stylistic range that you would want to, to, to be, train the neural network to recognize those patterns and to, to, send, to create a va and to output a number that, that tells how similar the current pattern is to those patterns in the training set. Then you would also have to give it in the training set patterns of things that you, architectural designs that you definitely don't like. So, and then you had to train it to give it a zero value for those patterns. The training can take days, perhaps a month, but once the neural net is trained, Every time you, you show it a, an architectural design that is not in the training set, that is similar in relevant respects to the ones that were in the training set, it will give it a value. Yeah, this, is, this has 0.6 degree of similarity to the, to the patterns that you already like. Or this has zero degree of similarity to the patterns that you already like. Now, philosophically, this raises a series of issues. I'm not going to be able to get in, into detail here. Specifically, similarity is a very hard notion to define because any two things are similar. I am very similar to this microphone in that we are both inhabitants of planet Earth or in that we are both moving less than the speed of light. There's a million irrelevant ways in which I am similar to this microphone. So here you need to, of course, specify a relevant criterion of similarity. That is typically done by carefully choosing the items in the training set. So there's creativity in the use of neural nets. You, 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 it's not an automatic, routine-like process. You need to get them to understand that certain aspects of the training set are irrelevant for making the comparisons and continue to train them for as long as they keep giving a bad response to that, to examples that you show them. Once you are satisfied that it only recognizes or gives high grades to patterns that, that, uh, that you like, now you can, and gives zero to patterns that you don't like, now you can use it. Now, I stress the fact that what we're doing there is cheating because you are not capturing aesthetic criteria in any way, shape, or form. The neural net, any more than the frisbee catching dog, knows what it's doing. It's simply learn how to catch a frisbee. It learn how to detect a pattern that you like, but it doesn't know what it's doing. So you're cheating. And the cheat can be dangerous sometimes because it can trap you within a space of possibilities of things that you already like. Whereas many times what is interesting is precisely to generate a design that you go, wow, I would have never given a high score to that design. And yet it's amazing. It's, and, and you would want to be surprised by the kinds of designs that the genetic algorithm can find in that space of possibilities, instead of artificially cornering it in that area of the space of possible designs that you already know you're comfortable with. However, until we manage to put aesthetics into a more formal footing, and until we manage to create mechanical recipes that can apply aesthetic criteria to buildings and other forms of art, using neural nets to enforce your taste is a good enough solution, at least to get the ball rolling. So at this point, we have sent our CAD building 
to another external program to check for its structural integrity. We have sent it to another external program, a neural net that was previously trained by you to check whether it falls within the aesthetic range that your taste falls within. The final thing that we need to check for is architectural functionality. You guys don't just design sculptures. As sculptures, you design spaces that need to be inhabited. You design spaces that need to be used for different reasons. And the way you design a museum will be different than the way you design a hospital. It will be different than the way you, uh, the, the way you define a, a, re a residence that will be lived in every day, maybe different than a country house, and, and so on and so forth. You're, you need to also check, and you keep this in mind when you are designing by hand, about patterns of usage. Patterns of usage by actual human beings that move in space and, and, and that find that the walls, the doors, the, the windows, the hallways that, that connect several doors, supply them with, supply the users with, opportunities for action. I know that within these walls, nobody can see me from outside, so these walls provide me with a certain amount of privacy. In fact, this gathering is a private gathering precisely because the walls now surround us and are not letting passerbys kind of peek in and, and, and try to figure out what we're doing here. We have a certain amount of privacy, and that privacy is being afforded to us by structural elements, I mean by architectural elements, walls in this case. Windows supply you with other opportunities, lighting, light, lighting opportunities, opportunities to play with light and for your design, uh, but also opportunities for people to move closer to the window when it's a hot day and gather around the window to use the doors to move to a different room Every aspect of your architecture will have what is called affordances, opportunities and risks that are afforded or supplied to or provided to the users. Now that we have not been able to check with the first two criteria that we had here. But you can check for functionality with yet a third piece of software that has become very common lately. It's called multi-agent systems. Multi-agent systems are very simple artificial intelligence agents that work always in groups, in collectivities, in populations. It's not a single robot, you know, like many of us think when we think about robotics, it's always communities of agents interacting with one another. And sometimes they solve problems precisely by acting collectively. So, multi-agent systems don't have, the, the, the agents themselves don't have to be as well defined as, say, the sims, that is, they don't have to have little arms and move around and so on, but they have to have enough, they need to be spatially situated so that they are in a particular place, facing in a particular direction, and with a certain amount of embodiment so that they cannot go through walls and so that they, uh, so that they, your CAD design can actually supply them with affordances, provide them with opportunities and risks for action. It is with artificial intelligence, it's now relatively easy to create these agents. These agents, of course, will be very dumb in most other respects. They will be, you won't be able to understand music, classical music, say, or read novels, or be able to create anything. All they can do is inhabit a space in a particular way, walk in a particular way, avoid each other, avoid collisions with each other, avoid collisions with the walls. But nevertheless, as long as you give them enough spatial intelligence and, and enough uh, uh, of, uh, of smarts to be able to occupy space in a more or less intentional way, you can unleash a small community of agents within your CAD design and check for patterns of usage. For instance, if in your original design, which is a public space, but that, that, so that there will be circulation of people that needs to have certain traffic patterns, for instance, lack of congestion would be one of your criteria for a good functionality of your thing, but at the same time, you may want, you may have created little nooks or crannies within which certain privacy can be without there being too much privacy, this being a public space, but enough so that people would like to kind of nest in those little nooks to, to have a little more intimate conversations prior to joining the rest of the people that are moving around. And let's assume that you, as you were designing, you created several spaces using, of course, architectural elements as your affordances to try to provoke or, or inform people as to what opportunities and risks for action you're giving them with a particular surface layout. Well, you can check 
whether the buildings that you're breeding are actually meeting that. As the last step, what you would need to do then would be to unleash a small community of agents within your CAD system and then have a program that checks to see whether congestion occurs in the circulation patterns, that would give him a bad score, whether in fact the little nooks or crannies that you created as intimate spaces are being used as intimate spaces, that is whether the agents spend a certain amount of time there before going about their business, whether they in fact conflict with one another in the use of spaces, a whole bunch of criteria that you, the designer, come up with. But you can now check them check for that, for the existence of those uses, for the emergence of those usage patterns without you having to be there. So, with that as our fitness function, you can now step away from the computer and let the computer do the search for you. As I said, that does convert you a little bit into a breeder, a dog breeder, a horse breeder, Dog breeders need to make aesthetic decisions. Sometimes they make really bad aesthetic decisions, like when they breed chihuahua dogs. I don't understand who made those choices, but obviously that person should be put in jail. <laughs> All the times they come up with wonderful designs, but what they're doing is teasing a design from the genetic material of a typical dog by selective breeding. But even though the use of the genetic algorithm may seem to be degrading your designer function to that of dog breeder, because at every point you need to make decisions that only an architect would make, how to up, what chromosome to use, how to apply the mutation operator, how to apply the sexual operator in a way that makes sense architecturally, how to train the neural net in order for it to have the relevant concept of similarity how to use multi-agent systems, how to train the, the multi-agent, the, the agents, so that they indeed behave in, within your building using the characteristic gates and the characteristic occup uh, in, uh, uh, habitation patterns that humans would. All those decisions demand creativity. None of those decisions is routine. So that by the, by the time you end with this, you have simply added one more tool to your design box. You have not replaced yourself because this is not going to, is all it's going to do is explore a space of possibilities, a space of possibilities defined by a bunch of parameters, a space of possibilities defined by the, by the, all the possible combinations of, of CAD instructions and, 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 and uh, if-then uh, uh, conditions. It's a much larger possibility space. And it is you who designs that space. So the creativity is simply being reoriented or refocused away from the final design to the process that generates the final design. You become designers of processes as opposed to designers of products. And, and nevertheless, since you do have to end up with a product at the end, that also is something that needs for you to check it aesthetically. It is you, in the end, that's going to approve or not approve with a genetic algorithm suggested to you. It is like a visualization tool. All it's allowing you to do is to visualize the space of possibilities in ways that are efficient and in ways that inform you about those spaces but it's not replacing you in the least. It is ultimately you who commands the genetic algorithm by all the different creative decisions that you had to make when you implement it. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you for a fantastic lecture. We have some time for questions. Can I ask one very quick question before I pass yeah. it on to the audience? Yes. Um, I, I noticed that this list of structural integrity, aesthetics, and functionality it sounds almost exactly like Vitruvius. Yes, Vitruvius actually mentioned firmitas, utilitas, and venustas, structural integrity, usefulness, and charm, or aesthetics, as, as his criteria. And I guess what I find interesting is you put that alongside Deleuze, the absent person in the room, as it were, 
who only looks at structural integrity and aesthetics. So there, there's something missing in Deleuze. But the, the question I want, a very brief question is, I've heard this lecture before, I've seen it beamed up online, I've shown it to my students, and it's fantastic to have it before. But the previous version we all saw was, of course, Deleuze of the use of the genetic algorithm. Uh, why has Deleuze been removed? Okay. Uh well, I mean, it touches on a on a point that uh, is kind of touchy for me. Um, I'm trying to quote Deleuze a little less, not so much because of Deleuze, but because of Deleuzeans. Unfortunately, just like just like what happened to Michel Foucault, who is a genius, but has been I have I have to use the word bastardized in in, in many humanities departments in the United States. It has been over semiotized. He has been forced to say things that he doesn't really say. I mean, just to give you an example, in the case of Foucault, he wrote a book called Discipline and Punish, which is very important for architects because it's about the architecture of hospitals, schools, prisons, barracks, factories, and how that architecture changed in the 17th and 18th century to allow for better monitoring and registration of behavior, and therefore to enforce the law, to enforce norms and rules in ways that are less drastic and less physical. The, uh, uh, the Foucault distinguished very clearly between, between discursive practices and non-discursive practices. Just to give you a, a, an example, to pair to a category of crime with a category of punishment, say stealing with cutting your hand, clearly is a discursive practice because you are using categories and pairing general categories. But the actual cutting of the hand it's a non-discursive, you cannot get any more discursive than maiming somebody. And yet ask 90% of humanity professors that teach Foucault whether cut, the cutting of the hand, whether surveillance, punishment, incarceration is discursive or non-discursive, and they will immediately ask, it's discursive. That's what Foucault did, reduce everything to discourse. And of course you want to strangle them right then or cut their hands. <laughs> if that is the appropriate punishment. Well, the same thing is happening to Deleuze right now. I've, I've sat in lectures, one with Rem Koolhaas, in which he was just nodding approvingly at this Deleuzean who was engaged in what I can only call a vomit of jargon. <laughs> it was Rem, your work is like a body without organs traversed by lines of flight that are of infinite value at infinite speeds. And, and Rem is like going like this. You know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm strangling myself because I don't know who to strangle. And I'm thinking, my God, these people are going to ruin Deleuze at least for at least one generation, just like they did to Deleuze. So at that point, I decided to, to stop quoting Deleuze. And I don't do that. If you, if you look at my new book, there's not even a single reference. But it's not because of Deleuze. It's because of Deleuzeans. OK? Early in your lecture, the part that I could follow comfortably and possibly even re replicate, you compared the compression of bones to the what of muscles? Oh, I, I said that bones carry loads in compression. And, and muscles carry loads in tension, tension. like suspension yeah, cables. Well, thank you. But in a much more adaptive way than we do in our designs. Uh, so we can learn from the vertebrae design uh, how, to, how to apply new combinations of, of, of load-bearing structures, combining tension and compression in unique ways. You could do that, by the way, using genetic algorithms, or rather, genetic programming. Yes, guys, come on. <laughs> I guess kind of um, within the confines of the fitness function, I was wondering if you could talk about meaning within all of this. And is the kind of rigor through iteration creating more meaningful solutions? Or is this whole process creating a new definition for meaning? And then on top of that, how do we as kind of human machines translate a computer's meaning into something that we find meaningful? OK, that's a good question. It's a big question, but I'm going to try to answer it. First of all, we need to distinguish, and this is something that is not done in the humanities either, two meanings of the word meaning. I know it sounds paradoxical, uh, but people don't distinguish the two meanings of the word meaning. When somebody asks you in the middle of a conversation, what do you mean? 
They might be asking for a definition. You might have used a term that they never heard, particularly if they are from a different language. So you define, you give them a, def a dictionary definition, and that's the meaning of the word. Or you may have used all the right words, and they understand all the right words, but one word is ambiguous. Bank. It can be a place where you put money. It can be a place where you sit. So they say, what do you mean? And what they're asking for you is to disambiguate a sentence. That is to give them the meaning of the full sentence that you intended to. Both of those senses are linguistic, of course. They refer to language. Language, and they are basically the semantic, they refer to the meaning is the semantic content of a word or a sentence. That's one sense of the word meaning. But when somebody comes to you and says, my life has no meaning, I feel like my life is meaningless. If you tell that person, well, I'm going to give you a dictionary definition and I will fix you, or I'm going to disambiguate you, it's probably going to look like you. It's like I'm going to shoot myself right now if you say one more word. <laughs> What that person says is not, I don't have a definition or I'm, I'm ambiguous, is I don't feel like make a difference. I don't feel significant. I don't feel important. I don't feel relevant to anybody's lives. In one case, we're talking about signification, the signification of words, the signification of sentences. In the other, way, in the other case, we're talking about significance. You think of the word insignificant. When you feel insignificant, you don't feel anything linguistic, you feel too small to make a difference. And making a difference is something you can do without words. You can do it with words, like Martin Luther King, I had a dream, that made a difference. But you can also do it with your lips sealed by going to Haiti and building and helping with the reconstruction. You make a difference, you become significant. So I'm sure the meaning of meaning that you have in mind is significance and not signification. And significance is here already from the moment you have to decide how to train your, your neural nets, for instance, because they need to be able to tell significant similarities with a training set, right? In other words, you build the meaning into, the gener into, the, into this program step by step by making sure, one, that the mutations are meaningful in the second sense. That is, that they produce architecturally meaningful changes in the operations, that they make a difference architecturally. They don't just flip a one into a zero and let's see what happens. You need to use the sexual recombination operator in a way that generates significant architectural differences and so on for all the different steps. This is why Architects need to be involved in the implementation of genetic algorithms or genetic programming because they are the only ones with a sense of what makes a difference and what doesn't make a difference. And you build in that meaning, in the sense of significance, step by step with each one of your decisions, right? So it is very important to say that because most people think that meaning is something for semioticians. And of course, the mutations are completely absent from this. This is a process, a morphogenetic process, a process that generates form and has generated form for millions of years before humans came along with their language and began to signify things, right? So it's important to keep signification and significance apart. And to answer your question, significance is built in by the designer at each one of the decision points that I, that I said. Yes. I have two questions. First one is arising from that one. Um, I know that when postmodernism happened, a big issue there was introducing signification back into architecture. Do you think that the role of symbols is something that can be played into this appropriately? And the, other, the, yeah, other the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the other question, which may be related, is um, what do you think of parametricism, quote unquote, as this, I guess, stylized version of genetic systems? Uh, hermeticism, you mean hermeneutics? You mean, uh, hermeticism. or. Hermeticism. As in hermetic knowledge when it's a. Parametricism. Oh, 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 parapatric design. <laughs> Yes, of course. Well, as we all know, Patrick does not distinguish between parametric design and procedural design. This is a point that Neil has been making for a while, and that is a big problem. Because then, you're this is an important form of design. 
in the, sense as, in, the, in the sense in which I said it before. Someone has to find the parameters, and the parameters need to be relations, at the very least ratios, but in, mo in many cases complex relationships between variables. Those, those things don't, don't stick out. You need to search for them. You need to actually actively create this, define each one of the dimensions of the space of possibilities one by one, and, and your designs are only gonna be as good as the resources that you brought in to find those parameters. So one problem with Patrick is, of course, that he doesn't give you the means to do that in his, in his supposed manifesto. If he's going to concentrate on parametric design, the very first thing he should be doing there is come up with some heuristics, if not with some rules of thumb, to select parameters and give us a bunch of examples not from his own studio, but from all the people's work it, that say, look at this, the space of possibilities that contains that design has this interesting, significant parameters that you can vary and you vary it in a way that, that makes architectural sense. I don't, I, at least in the presentation that I saw, I never saw him doing that. I, I saw him using the term parametric design to encompass all kinds of design by process. And that is just simply wrong. We need to at least differentiate parametric from procedural. Second, if you're going to do that in the form of a manifesto, you need to get your math and your technical aspects extremely right. You need to be you know, very well informed as to, for instance, what are the relationships between topology as a geometry and Euclidean geometry, which you guys are already aware of that because you use nerves, which you can flex, and then you use polygons that you try to flex them and they break, right? <laughs> you guys use already the difference between differential geometry and topology, which is nerves, and Euclidean geometry, which is rigid polygons, and you know that different operations apply differently to each. Now, I'm not, I'm not putting down polygons because, for instance, uh, surface subdivision amazes me sometimes as to the kinds of things that it can come up with polygons. I never thought that surface subdivision could add such a new, could inject life into polygons, which are the deadest thing possible. I don't know of any mathematician that has come up to terms with surface subdivision as a way of injecting life into Euclidean geometry, but Patrick doesn't even seem to know that, that there is already a 150-year-old German tradition of all, of all places of comparing different geometries is the, is the tradition of Felix Klein, who at the middle of the 19th century was the first one to realize that Euclidean geometry, projective geometry, differential geometry, and topology had not been invented yet, but eventually was added, form a, a sequence of geometries that can be converted into one another via what is called broken symmetries, by breaking the symmetries of the, of the spaces that each one of these geometries form. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but it's, it has a name. It's called the Erlanger program invented by Felix Klein, the inventor of the Klein bottle, which is a three-dimensional version of the Mobius strip. A, a fabulous mathematician from the 19th century who Patrick should be paying homage to who Patrick should be saying, this was said 150 years ago by one of my compatriots. It would actually work with his entire I'm German and this is it approach. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. And if you don't do that, then you lose credibility. So I would say, without trying to put him down in any way, because I consider him a very nice person and a very smart person, it was premature to launch his, this is the new style for the 21st century thing, without having worked out all the details. You know, you can propose it, but you cannot launch it as the new style if you have not worked out all the relevant details. Hopefully, nobody, none of you guys are gonna make the same mistake. Um, thank you for a great, Lecture. Uh, I just have a. I noticed that in your uh, flow of um, um, ideas, you kind of constantly remind us that um, uh, this is additional to being whatever talents or the gifts that architecture architects have acquired. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, debate on whether we would take a position saying all architecture we know and the way architects have been working with are all. Uh, past, we can we divorce it, divorce it, 
say this is this is wrong, um, completely start a new kind of um, paradigm where this can give us a truly uh, great uh, um, uh, um, discourse or architect, both for practice and thinking about it, right? So obviously, um, uh, in the context of a research university, that means a lot. And you just have to stay in such a purity, saying this is the, the birth of a new architecture, a new way of creating it. So now we close the school. We don't teach whatever we have been teaching, saying this is all wrong. And then what would you uh, imagine a team that can actually start this new school and completely abandoning what, because I do felt every time when we kind of connect the two worlds together, then it became extremely difficult that kind of carry on the, 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 the mission and really uh, in hope for a new uh, new era. So obviously, because um, that that that's qualified as uh, the most fundamental researches uh, for the way it's been done and for the definition that a building can uh, can be defined. So I'm basically asking you. Let's say you start a new school. Who are the people on the table you wanted to pick <laughs> and forming? Well, before getting so uh, detailed, let me just say a few things, some of which are anecdotal, but nevertheless, they may be useful. I made a living as a computer animator for a long time. Nobody would give me any money to write my books because they were crazy books, and, and people don't give money for crazy books. So I had to make a, li make a living doing something else, and that was being a computer animator. And uh, I remember I was a freelancer. And I remember working for several uh, companies, but one in particular run by this Greek guy, very good animator. And I remember that when he interviewed new people to come in, he never, even though we were a computer animation studio, he never asked them for a computer animation portfolio. He always asked them, show me your traditional animation portfolio. Uh, because he knew that if you know, for instance, what is anticipated action, you know, if you're a cartoon character, you're going to throw a punch, you typically first go like this, and then you throw the punch. Right. And if you're going to stop, you never stop like this, you keep going a little bit and then bounce back a little bit. You always exaggerate the action in different directions, whether it's going to be that direction or it's going to be this direction. If you land, you shrink a lot more than you should, and then you stand up, and even when you stand up, you overshoot a little, and then you come back. That is a trick that only traditional animators know. Nothing about computers can teach you that trick. And it's something that eventually becomes know-how. Most, most, in other words, skill. You simply are skilled at doing certain things, and you express that skill by doing them, even if you could not explain what anticipated action is. So what this guy was doing was basically saying, I want that know-how. I want the old-fashioned animation skill because I can give them the computer skills, and then they will shine in the new medium. But if it's a guy that comes in with a Photoshop portfolio, with a portfolio exclusively in computers, and it's forgotten all about the old-fashioned craft, it might not, you might not be able to train him in the old-fashioned craft. So then, that was the introduction to my answer. So my answer basically is this. We, I do not believe that we can discard old-fashioned skills. We may be able to discard old-fashioned ideas, which is a very different thing. It's linguistic knowledge, knowledge that can be expressed in the form of sentences. Many of those sentences contain now what we would call stereotypes about what architecture should or should not be. Many of those sentences express values that now we find obsolete. Many of those sentences express design strategies that have not paid out, and we know they have not yielded all the results that they promised. So discard the sentences, but keep the skills, even drawing skills, even drafting skills, because you might be able to then, skills as opposed to habits are adaptable, adaptable to new situations. And at least in my experience as a computer artist, the, the better computer artists were the ones that were good at traditional art and then learned computer art without forgetting about their roots. So I'm sorry if I'm not giving you the right answer to your question, but I do not see how we could, in other words, unlike theoretical science in which you can have quantum physics replace classical physics, or you can have relativity replace classical physics, because it's all about 
linguistic knowledge or mathematical knowledge, knowledge that's already being codified, laboratory practices in which all that matters is, you know, your, your, your ability to manipulate, the, to, to look through a microscope and to, de and to detect and sense subtle differences and so on, do not suffer the kind of paradigm shifts that theoretical science suffers. So you, when you're talking about linguistic knowledge, you do have sudden abrupt changes like classical physics is dead, quantum physics lives. But when you, when you go and see the experimenter that, for instance, allowed Einstein to prove Brownian motion by putting little tiny little bits of pollen in water, looking at the microscope, through the microscope and showing by making certain measurements that, in fact, it was a molecular motion, invisible molecular motion that was pushing the little particles of pollen around and, and proved uh, uh, Einstein's theory of Brownian motion, that guy did not suffer any paradigm shift. He could have talked to a 19th century scientist, just as he could talk to an early 20th century scientist. In fact, it was the laboratory scientists with their skills, it's their know-how, their non-articulated, the non-verbal knowledge that bridged the gap between the two theoretical paradigms. So in the, in the sense of creating a new school that would bring brand new ideas, yes, what computers have given us with their ability to create simulations is invaluable in the sense that you know, the first time I heard about the genetic algorithm, I felt like a person who had first seen a cubist painting, right? We never lived that because we're too young, but you can imagine the first person who trained in classical paintings that saw the Mademoiselle d'Avignon. Like, oh my God, what is that? It was like a, a shock, but at the same time, the pleasure of, of being shocked out of your conformity. The genetic algorithm did the same thing for me. All of a sudden, you were breeding creatures. Well, not, no one could do that before, at least not in a controlled way without real animals. So not only this software, but the different types of software that I talked about provide us with a complete new paradigm. But I wonder if we, do, if we, do, if we want to sever all links to the past or, or whether we want to keep the equivalent of laboratory artists providing, that is, skillful architects that may not have the best theories in the world and may open their mouths and stereotypes may come out, but nevertheless know how to do certain things, to provide us that continuity with the past so that whatever resources are worthwhile saving, and I'm sure there's an entire reservoir of resources that are worthwhile saving, are not lost in the transition. Because otherwise we may sin no, sin is too, is too strong a word. We may uh, commit the error of being, you know, of going for the flashy new software and forgetting that ultimately the software doesn't do anything by itself. It needs skillful operators. This is why I was trying to point all the, all the entry points for creativity here, the decision of what parameters to use, the decision of what language to use, how to, ask, how to articulate your operators, and so on and so, and so forth, to show that you need architects to implement this for architecture. No one is going to be able to do it for you because you need the know-how of architects. Yeah. So without trying to tell you, you know, I know that you know much more about how to run a school than I do. I have no idea how to do that. I would say, yes, let's create a break with the past in terms of linguistic coded knowledge. Let's get rid of as many stereotypes as we can. But let's at least put a bridge so that the skills of past architects can still be relevant today. Yeah? <laughs> Boy. <laughs> There's a host of, of answers, let's... Give me Everybody questions. raised their hand at once, it's like, kill that guy. Is he Mexican? <laughs> let's lynch him. Oh my God. Is that a back door? Um, my question actually predates that answer, so I'm not... Although I is responding to what you just said. Um, I wanted to ask you, are you making a kind of argument for... Um, finding a way for architects to be more than mere consumers of this software. It seems to me that there's a place where architects need to start engaging the code, right, in a way that we had always been in control of our tools when they were more simple. I could not put it better myself. This is why I encourage my students 
to learn not necessarily programming, you don't have to become a computer scientist, that's not going to fit with your career, you're not going to have time to do that, but learn how to write scripts. It is, it is obvious from the history of software, you see say Maya, which evolved from Wavefront and Alias. Eventually Maya realized that in order to give control to the artist, you couldn't just allow the artist to just mouse and click and, and menu its way around the thing. You needed to give him a scripting language called Mail, which allows you to do the same thing, but put it in the form of a process, a process that you can look at and then run, it generates a form, and now you have a better sense of what the process is. So now you go change the process, it changes the form. But if you don't know how to script, half of the potential of that, of Maya, or of Autodesk, or any other, all software programs I call with scripting capabilities, even Photoshop, which you would never think it would come with scripting capabilities, but it has little scripts called actions. Because what they, allow, they want you to do is to be able to think in terms of process, a well-defined process. And yes, I tell my students, look, if you use Photoshop without scripts, the look of your designs is basically being de decided by the guy who wrote Photoshop. You know, and that's why Photoshop things look like each other, right? I mean, there is such a thing as an over Photoshop design. Just look at Wire Magazine, right? Or, well, Wire Magazine before the new look, anyway. But like layers and things, and you go, how many layers in Photoshop this have? You could, you could see the Photoshop. And the whole point would be not to see the Photoshop, that you, the artist, develop the style to such an extent that now nobody even cares what tool you used. The only way to do that is to get inside Photoshop and make it do things that it wasn't supposed to do. Now, what's true for 2D is much more true for 3D, with, with, with a much more complicated space of possibilities that it has, a much more complicated set of operators, the extra dimension that it has, it, it becomes a waste of time to click and mouse your way around uh, instead of start to think about process. And first of all, you will never remember what sequence of clickings and mousings you did. Wow, this is, I, I'm, so, I'm so good, look at that shit. How did I do it? I mean, what was the sequence? Whereas if you f begin to define it as a process and learn how to think in terms of process instead of final product, you will always have a reference point of how you did it. And now you can begin altering the process to generate new forms. So I always advise my students, and I teach exclusively at architecture schools, partly because of the reason I said before, you guys are half artists, half scientists, and that is the way it should be in general. I wish painters today were like painters in the past. They were half scientists. You know, they did their own pigments. They, they shopped around for the right minerals and stuff. They were mineralogists in addition to being painters. They felt proud of it. And if they found a new blue that comes from this type of copper mixed with this type of thing, they would never tell the secret to anybody because that's my blue, right? And that pride has disappeared. Has disappeared, of course, and completely in the case of conceptual art, but it has even disappeared in the case of painting, because now, you know, Windsor and Newton tells you what the color is supposed to be. So I wish all artists went back to that point, to the point where scientists had to consult artists about certain things. They knew more about pigments, they knew more about sounds and acoustics, they knew more about the human body, if they were choreographers, than scientists did, because they had one foot in art, one foot in science. So the best way of doing it in today's environment is to learn how to script. That's going to give you a foothold within the scientific world. Yeah. Okay, uh, my question is about uh, adaptation and response, and um, the issue that there's also there's always seems to be like a search for you know finding the most um, I guess optimized way to you know respond to tectonic requirements or um, What's the, how do you optimize a building computationally to respond to ecologic issues? Uh, and, but there's often this sort of, um, I mean, as I see a lot of this indexical parametric algorithmic based one, there's no such for real adaptation in that today we live in sort of like an entropic world, you know, we deal with financial indexes, which is, a, you know, we live in a complex adaptive world but the response to the sort of architecture that's extracted from these processes does not respond to these real life issues. You know, Dow goes 100 points down, 
but the warehouse remains the same geometry, everything stays the same. There's no yeah, response to your call, you know, the environment and this and that. But it doesn't negotiate core humanistic problems or I guess issues. Well, I mean, in, the, in this particular, I mean, I would agree with you as a general fact. Green architecture, architecture that leaves a smaller foot, environmental footprint, and a, a, a architecture that's not wasteful of energy, architectural that that uh, that tries to blend with other parts of the environment to create a, ver a, a better visual ecology. All those ideas, you know, they've been around for decades, but as you probably correctly say, they have ne not quite been implemented, and they should, because they are part of what we might call an ethics of architecture, not, not a morality of architecture, good and evil, but an ethics in the Spinozian sense, poison versus food, combinations of buildings and environment that are, that are nutritious, that enhance both the building and the environment versus combinations that are degrading that you might have your building there, but it is in fact degrading other aspects of the environment by the, uh, a wrong use of water, the, the excessive use of air conditioning instead of trying to, you know, say, heat one surface and keep another cold to create circulation air patterns that are spontaneous and try to use that spontaneity of nature as part of your design. No, let's just crank up the, the air conditioner all the way up. You know, this is LA after all. So I agree with you with that, but it would be relatively simple to add a number four there, which is check for ecological adaptivity, right? And you would still have other, other software package, and other software package that, that would simulate weather conditions, would simulate impact on, on, on nearby communities. For instance, if you're creating a very large building that will cast a shadow uh, at certain, you know, during certain key parts of the day over a nearby community and therefore, you know, make that community, you know, that community used to have sun and, and the four to six hour used to be when everybody went out to, uh, uh, I'm just making this up, of course, when I, you know, went out to uh, the cafes and so on because they, the, sh the, the sun shined brightly. And you don't know with your tall building three blocks away that it's going to cast such a long shadow that's going to kill that little area there. Well, you could check for that in your genetic algorithm. If you're smart enough, you add a number four here that would now add context, that would add not just structural engineering requirements, but water usage requirements, energy usage requirements, and would try to, and would assign a, a fitness value to your design in terms of how well it's also meeting these other environmental concerns. And because you're using evolution, and evolution is the original way of creating adaptive shapes, right? It's the original way that Earth, planet Earth used to create fishes that are adapted to water, birds that are adapted to an aerial environment, mammals and other terrestrial animals that are adapted to their niches so very well, you know that as long as you put a fitness function that checks for those values that concern you, and as long as you're creative enough to formulate that fitness function in such a way that it actually works, that it, that it checks for values that actually are there, your buildings will evolve to meet those requirements. So I don't see any, any problem with using genetic algorithms to create adaptive buildings. In fact, thank you for letting me, thank, giving me that idea. Next time I give this lecture, I'm going to put a number four. <laughs> Check for ecological viability. Check for ecological footprint. That shouldn't be so hard, given that a lot of that has already been digitized. You could even use services like Google Maps and things like that, with that so that you don't have to recreate everything yourself. You could do streams of information coming from the internet, use that to create an environment in which you put your buildings and then assign a fitness function depending on certain criteria that you, uh, that you, that you specified as, as, uh, as to what counts as a low environmental footprint and that would be added to the fitness value and that would be then guide evolution towards adaptivity in, in terms of energy usage, in terms of water usage, in terms of minimizing the impact that you have on, on, on the local environment, it would be part of the, of, the, of the building. So the final shape produced would actually be adaptive in the sense that you're, that you're saying.
Maybe I could just finish with a, with a final comment. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable that uh, Manuel has given this lecture and hold an entire audience spellbound for almost two hours without <laughs> using a single image. I think that's a lesson for all our... Or a single big word. I think a big word. I, I, I actually had a student came up to me the other day uh, after one of my lectures and said, that was very clear. That was that was almost Delanda-esque. So there's a new term that we have now <laughs> for, for lecturing, Delanda-esque. Uh, Clarity is a new black. <laughs> I think so. What I would like to 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 do is, is, I mean, it's a great pleasure, of course, to have Manuel here for this entire two weeks. But a, a special pleasure to have this you know, incredibly illuminating and insightful. Uh, uh, lecture. So I'd like to thank Manuel for, for one, of the, one of the most interesting lectures I've ever heard, but also I'd like to say for a distinctly unpostmodern lecture without a single image and certainly, certainly no Photoshop at all. Thank you, Manuel.